Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, your friendly guide to the English language. We talk about writing, history, rules, and other cool stuff. Since last week I mentioned using commas for which clauses, I thought it'd be good to talk about the difference between which and that this week. And after that, we'll talk about fun words for walking, like trapes and sachet. To understand the difference between which and that, first you need to understand the difference between a restrictive element and a non-restrictive element, because the simple rule is to use that with a restrictive element and which with a non-restrictive element. So a restrictive element is just part of a sentence you can't get rid of because it specifically restricts the noun. Here's an example. The cupcakes that have sprinkles are still in the fridge. The words that have sprinkles restrict the kind of cupcake we're talking about. Without those words, the meaning of the sentence would change. Without them, we'd be saying that all the cupcakes are still in the fridge, not just the ones with sprinkles. And restrictive elements are not surrounded by commas. Here's another example. Cupcakes that are decorated for the 4th of July are on sale. We can't get rid of the words that are decorated for the 4th of July because then we'd be saying all cupcakes are on sale, not just the special ones. So that means the phrase is restrictive. And here's one more example. Cupcakes that have strawberries give me hives. I can't get rid of the words that have strawberries because then I'd be saying all cupcakes give me hives, not just the ones with strawberries, which isn't true. I can eat all kinds of cupcakes, just not those that have strawberries. On the other hand, a non-restrictive element is something that can be left out without changing the meaning of the sentence. A non-restrictive element is simply additional information. Cupcakes with sprinkles, comma, which are my favorite, comma, always seem to get eaten first. Leaving out the words, which are my favorite, doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. With or without the words, which are my favorite, we know that cupcakes with sprinkles are the first to go. And non-restrictive elements are surrounded by commas. The way I think of it is that you could grab both those commas, pick up the element, and throw it out of your sentence, and it would still make sense. Here's another example. The cupcakes that are on sale, comma, which are decorated for the 4th of July, comma, all have sprinkles. We could lift out the words, which are decorated for the 4th of July, and the meaning of the sentence wouldn't change. Those words just give us some extra information, meaning they're non-restrictive, surrounded by commas, and which is the right word. And you may recall from last week's episode that these words could also be surrounded by parentheses or dashes, depending on what kind of tone you want for your sentence. Here's a final example. Cupcakes, comma, which don't need to be cut into pieces for serving, comma, are a great choice for children's parties. Again, we could pick up the words which don't need to be cut into pieces for serving, throw them out, and not change the meaning of the sentence. Cupcakes are still a great choice for children's parties. Those words, which don't need to be cut into pieces for serving, are just extra information, meaning they're non-restrictive, surrounded by commas, and which is the right word choice. And here's a quick and dirty tip for the simple rule. If you think of the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz, you know it's okay to throw her out. She's bad, so we want to get rid of her. We're going to pick up the Wicked Witch and throw her out, just like you can pick up the witch part of your sentence and throw it out. You won't change the meaning of the sentence without the witch phrase. So you can throw out the witch phrase, commas and all. If you can do that and it doesn't change the main meaning of the sentence, then you know that which is the right choice. If you try to throw out the phrase and it does change the meaning of the sentence, then you know the right choice is that instead of which, because it's a restrictive element. Now that's the simplified rule that I find works for a lot of people who get frustrated trying to decide which word to use. But you also should know that the situation is more complicated than what I just explained. 
That was the safe rule. You'll never go wrong with that, but some authorities say that which can actually be used for both restrictive and non-restrictive phrases. And it's actually very common for people who use British English to use which when American speakers would use that. The distinction between the two just hasn't held up in British English the way it has in American English. So if you're British, know that some Americans might think you've made a mistake when you use which with a restrictive element. Or they may be dazzled by your accent and not even notice, because we're like that. And if you're American, but you love the sound of the word which in all your sentences and want to use it, well, if anyone challenges you, you can just say you're using British English. I do think the distinction between the two words is useful, though, because they can convey different ideas. Consider these two examples. Cupcakes that are time-consuming to make tend to be crowd-pleasers. And cupcakes, comma, which are time-consuming to make, comma, tend to be crowd-pleasers. In the first example, cupcakes that are time-consuming to make tend to be crowd-pleasers, I'm saying that there are different kinds of cupcakes, some that are time-consuming to make and some that aren't. And probably only those that are time-consuming to make are the crowd-pleasers. In this second example, cupcakes, comma, which are time-consuming to make, comma, tend to be crowd-pleasers, I'm saying that, at least to me, all cupcakes are time-consuming to make. And I think that can be a useful distinction. And I'll finish this segment with a little grammatical aside. When they're used in the way we've been talking about, that and which are called relative pronouns. Now, I know it seems weird because you usually think of pronouns as words such as he and she. Relative pronouns don't get talked about as much as other pronouns, but they are real pronouns. They head up subordinate clauses. Other relative pronouns include who, whom, why, where, and when. To sum up, the simplest rule is to choose the relative pronoun that when you can't get rid of the element, and the relative pronoun which when you can get rid of the element and it won't change the meaning of the sentence. Remember that it's always safe to throw out the witches. As the weather gets nicer, it's time to amble back outside and spend time traipsing through the flowers. Since we previously meandered through eight words for walking with surprising origins, we're going to ambulate through six more words to prepare for walking weather. To ambulate simply means to walk or move around, and popped up around 1620. Ambulate stems from the Latin ambulatus, the past participle of ambulare, with the same meaning. But this word is so much more. Ambulate is linked to amble, meaning to move easily and gently, just as a horse does when it lifts the two legs on one side and then the two on the other side. On the more loud side of the etymology, the same root also gives us the word ambulance, which was originally a movable hospital. Now, the words perambulate and ambulate both come from that Latin root ambulare. You may often hear perambulate used as a fancy word to say someone walked, but technically, perambulate refers to walking through, about, or over something, even though it does come from the more general word amble. This particular form first appeared in the 15th century, predating ambulate. The only difference between ambulate and perambulate is obviously the prefix per, which also comes from Latin, where it means through. It's the addition of that prefix that changes the meaning to walk through. Do you ever go on a constitutional after dinner? Well, the meaning of this type of constitutional doesn't pertain to a body of rules, customs, or laws. Instead, it comes from the good it can do a body's constitution— specifically an individual's physical health, strength, and appearance. Although the root of constitution goes back to relating to the settled-upon law and regulations, the meaning eventually led to the settled condition of one's health, whether they have a weak constitution or a strong constitution. A constitutional is short for constitutional walk, referring to an act of walking that is beneficial to bodily health. 
Edam Online speculates the constitutional walk most likely originated around 1829 among university students as they were taking walks or exercising. For those familiar with ballet, a sachet refers to a gliding step. Though the reference to dancing is the typical use, sachet also refers to a casual walk or glide, and a walk that is ostentatious or provocative. Again, according to Edam Online, the word sachet is mangled English of the French word chasse, meaning chaste, C-H-A-S-E-D. Sacheting onward to the word trapes, the origin of this one is a bit of a head-scratcher, since sources ultimately say the origin is unknown. It means to walk about aimlessly, and some people think the word may come from the old French word trespasser, which meant to pass over or beyond. The Oxford English Dictionary says it can also mean to tramp or trudge, and another possible origin would be words from a variety of European languages meaning to tramp, wander, flee, as in the Middle Dutch trappen, dialectical Norwegian trappe, or German trabben. According to Edam Online, there's even evidence to show trapes with slang used by soldiers and vagabonds between 1400 and 1700. We'll end our walk today with a promenade. This word came into English directly from French in the 1560s. And although you may be having flashbacks to square dancing class in grade school if you grew up in the United States, and it is a word used in dancing, in the walking sense, a promenade is a leisurely walk, a walk for pleasure or display. And if you're thinking of the promenade deck on The Love Boat, a TV series that was popular in the 70s and 80s, yes, that deck on a cruise ship is the one that lets passengers walk around the perimeter. It's a place to either get some exercise or to see and be seen, depending on your perspective. That segment was written by Michaela Dunn, a Wyoming-based editor and publisher for Every When Press. She specializes in magical realism, low fantasy, folklore, and fairy tales. Finally, I have a familect story from Andrea. Hi, this is Andrea Phillips. I live in Tennessee, but my family is from Texas and Oklahoma. And I was recently with my brother, and we used a word that I thought might be a good example of a family. So I was at my brother's house for my nephew's graduation, and we were getting food ready for all the guests coming to the cookout. And my sister-in-law asked my brother if he got a bottle of damage. He said he did. And I said, oh, good, a bottle of damage. And we all knew that we were talking about a watermelon. As long as I can remember going back to my grandparents' house and my family of origin, we have always called a watermelon a bottle of damn it. The story goes that my father, when he was a little boy, couldn't say watermelon, and it came out bottle of damn it, and everybody thought that was funny and just started calling watermelons bottle of damn it. And uh, so we, today, we don't use it all the time, and we only use it amongst ourselves. Uh, most of the time we do call watermelon watermelon, but it's like a family code word when one of us calls the watermelon a bottle of damn it. And now that my dad's kids are starting families of their own, uh, my dad's grandkids rather, are starting families of their own, well, we we'll just have to see if that tradition continues to future generations or if it's going to die with us or maybe if this gets shared on the podcast, somebody else might pick it up. Um, and by the way, I have no idea how to spell bottle of damn it. <laughs> That's a word that we say. I don't think I've ever seen it written down. Uh, I hope you found that funny, maybe interesting. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks so much, Andrea. Watermelons are great for family get togethers, which is also a great time to have some fun and reinforce your family acts for the younger generations. If you want to share your family act, a word or phrase your family and only your family uses, call the voicemail line at 833214GIRL. Call from a nice, quiet place and be sure to tell me the whole story behind your family act because that's always the best part. Finally, my mission this summer is to tell every educator I can reach about my LinkedIn learning courses because they are free through most university and county libraries, and they contain the perfect bite-sized lessons for your students. Do they struggle with active and passive voice? I have a three-minute video about it. Parallel structure? I have a three-minute video about it. Comma splices? 
You guessed it, I have a three minute video about it. And all these professionally produced videos also have carefully edited transcripts for your students who need read along support. Videos make great bell ringers or assignments, and the courses themselves have built in chapter quizzes. And did I mention they're often free through your library? So if you're thinking about fall lesson plans, check out my courses and think about how you can incorporate these practical videos to make your teaching job easier. And if you aren't a teacher, do me and them a favor and pass this information along. I want to be sure as many people are benefiting from these free videos as possible. Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to Holly Hutchings in digital operations, Davina Tomlin in marketing, Nathan Sems in audio, Brandon Getches, director of podcasts, and Morgan Christensen in advertising, who has two nephews and one niece. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. Remember to look for the show again Thursday when I have an interview with my frequent guest writer, Samantha Enslin, and her husband, Greg, because they recently bought their hometown newspaper, which I think is just about the best thing ever. That's all. Thanks for listening.